Hello, everybody, and welcome to Church Militant's Marion Moments. I'm Michael Voris. This is our show that we're bringing you throughout the entire Wuhan pandemic as a reinforcement for the supernatural thoughts that we should be having in the midst of all of the anxiety causing, you know, stories and events and everything that are going on. Uh, you know, unemployment, the, uh, uh, the gross domestic product numbers were just released earlier today, and the economy shrunk by... Uh, roughly 5%, 4.6 or 4.8%, uh, one more quarter like that, which there probably will be, uh, is the official definition of a recession. So we will have been put into the Wuhan recession or the Chinese Communist Party recession because of the pandemic. That obviously means there's 26, 28 million Americans who are now unemployed. All of this uh, causes a great deal of anxiety because there's also, of course, the knock-on effect. It's not just 28 million people, but it's 28 million people who are also sitting in their homes and are, you know, concerned and anxious about what's the, what's the future going to hold. Are they going to have a job to go back to? Did the business fold? All of those sorts of things. They're, they're great, uh, you know, great disturbers of, of your peace. I mean, we do have to get by in the material world, of course. Uh, so... Uh, to not put, not to neglect any of that, but to say that we can't put a hundred percent of our eggs in that basket. We also have to think about the things spiritual, and perhaps, and hopefully, many people uh, are realizing that you know th there are many things about life that are fragile. Life itself is fragile. Seems like everything's going along just fine, then all of a sudden, bam, it's over. Uh, sometimes it's a prolonged illness. Sometimes it's sudden, a car accident, a heart, sudden heart attack. You know, whatever, something like that. Uh, so life itself is fragile, and many of the components, individual components of life, are fragile. So we always have to think our, make our, uh, have our thoughts uh, be concentrated on the supernatural, as difficult as that is. And we don't, again, we don't discard and ignore the things of the world, the things of our day-to-day -day life. We have to live. We are material beings in a material world. That means means we need, uh, we have material goods, and needs, and wants, and things that have to be satisfied. Uh, but they're not the only part of us. We're also spiritual, which is the point of the show. We're not just also spiritual, by the way. We are predominantly spiritual, uh, but we just have an awful lot of matter that comes along with that. So the show is based on our little booklet here, Mary Day by Day. Uh, promo this, uh, use this every day as a little prayer. It's a little maybe one minute less than uh, reflection on a particular thought about our Blessed Mother. It goes from a scripture passage to a reflection uh, usually by the saint of the day. Today is the feast day of St. Catherine of Siena, so appropriately in the reflection today on the scripture passage, uh, St. Catherine has the reflection on it, and then we have a little prayer. So we'll do that first. We open every show like that. From the prophet Nehemiah, But you are a God of mercy, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and full of love. Therefore you did not forsake them. Remember that, everybody, no matter how far away you may feel you are from God, pay attention to that. It's, a, it's one of the more uh, beautiful, reflective, and famous quotes from all of Scripture. You are a God of mercy, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and full of love. Therefore, you did not forsake them. Never, ever, ever, ever be afraid of turning back to God. Our reflection, again, of course, from St. Catherine of Siena, since that her, is her feast day today. Have recourse to that dear Mary, who is the mother of mercy. She will take you into her son's presence and use her motherly intercession with him on your behalf so that he will be merciful toward you. That, is a, that reflection from St. Catherine, of course, comes from the understanding of the queen mother. Uh, and, of course, she is our uh, she's mother of God also, but she's also the queen mother who makes the petition to her son, who is king, uh, and he finds it extremely difficult to say no to her. Uh, so it's a beautiful thought by St. Catherine of Siena. Our prayer then for today, O Mary, mother of mercy, and she is the mother of mercy, never cease to intercede for me with your merciful son. Let, re let me remember that all human beings are fallible and I need God's mercy to reach my eternal goal. Yes, we do. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Master, how can we be saved? With you it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Yep. No grace, no salvation. So, uh, anyway, uh, we are talking this week about, uh, as we will be talking about for the rest of the time, uh, just as a recap, in case you didn't catch it earlier this week, uh, we are 
uh, here in Michigan on shutdown till at least May 15th, which is uh, two weeks from Friday. Uh, the governor here just keeps bumping it back two weeks, three weeks, two weeks, three weeks, just keeps pushing it back. So as of now, we're supposed to open on May 15th. When we open, uh, the show Marion Moments will go away in its current 1 p.m. every day live form, and we'll come back at some point in the hopefully near future uh, with uh, another version of Marion Moments. Still the same topics and things, but uh, not so uh, you know not so informal as it is right now. But anyway, uh, so this week and the whole rest of the time, we're going to be talking about typology. Uh, very specific examples. We have the little uh, graphic we've used a few times already this week. Typology and theology and biblical exegesis. Remember, exegesis is just digging through the scriptures, trying to find out what things mean. Concerns itself with the relationship of the Old Testament to the New Testament. And we looked, uh, we've looked. we looked at some of the relationships between uh, our Lord and Adam. Uh, yesterday, we started looking at the relationships between our Lord and Moses. Moses was a type for our Lord, uh, and then we started talking about specifically Moses. Now, if you watch the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, uh, you know the the Ark of the Covenant doesn't really have much of a role in there. It's all about you know the the uh, theatrics and drama of getting out of Egypt and the you know Cecil B. DeMille splitting the Red Sea and all that sort of thing. But uh, Moses says after he brings the people out, what really becomes the center point. Of, uh, of the uh, chosen people's experience in the desert and moving into the Holy Land is the Ark of the Covenant inside the tabernacle, the big tent that was set up. Eventually, once they get into the Holy Land and it gets to about the year 1000 and David is king and his son Solomon becomes king and he builds the temple, the first temple, and, and they build the Holy of Holies and they put the Ark in it. Uh, but for these first few hundred years from Mount Sinai until Solomon builds the temple, the ark is being carried around within a great big tent that's called the tabernacle. Uh, so what is that a type for or who, I guess would be a better way to say it, is that a type for? Well, let's look at some things first. Let's look at the Moses Christ uh, typology going on here. We have, first of all, uh, that the new Moses, which is our Lord, needs a new ark. We also have... Uh, that central, the ark has a central role in the exodus and what follows after it, the ark itself. The ark itself is to be where he meets his people. Yesterday we read that section from Exodus where that is what the Lord God said. The ark is where I will meet my people. And uh, it's to be placed in the tabernacles we just went over. What again he said will be my dwelling. So he will live in the uh, ark. I'm sorry, he will live among the people and uh, the meeting place will be the ark and it will happen in his dwelling, which will be the tabernacle. Now let's talk about the ark or God, I'm sorry, God commands, God, specific point here, God commands how it is to be constructed. There are a few times in sacred scripture where God sort of takes over and says, this is how it's going to be done. You will do it this way. You will build the ark uh, the Noah's Ark, Ark, this way. You will build this Ark, this way. The temple is to be built this way. Uh, and they're very, very specific. Now, let's look at the Ark specifically. Now, what are some things we know about it? Again, the new Exodus, which is what we're talking about here with Christ, requires a new Ark because the Ark has the central, uh, is the central point, the central meaning. The ex it is what leads, what is leading the people to their goal. And when Moses leaves, when Moses leaves uh, 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 Egypt uh, with the Hebrew nation, he leads them through the desert to the Holy Land. So there's a journey going on there. And at the head of the journey is the ark and the tabernacle. Well, our Lord, who is the new Moses, uh, requires a new ark. And what is the point of that? That is to get, it is to lead from one point of the journey to the other. So it is the dwelling place of God on earth, as we have said. Next point here. Uh, and it contains inside the ark are the Ten Commandments, which are the word of God, the written word of God. Aaron's staff, Aaron was Moses' brother. Uh, that is a representation of the priestly office. And the manna, which is the bread from heaven. Leave that up for a second, guys. If, there is, uh, if you look right there, the word of God, the priestly office, and the bread from heaven... Uh, 
the word word uh, is what we translate. The actual word in Greek is logos. And logos means uh, not just what God says, but it is sort of the binding force of all creation. It is what uh, all of creation is made through and binds it all together. And if you think in, the ter in terms of the first few words of the Gospel of St. John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and nothing that was came into being without the Word. So the Word actually is a person. It's the second person of the Holy Trinity. So the actual written down on the two tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments, are they are a type, that's the law, they are a type of Christ also. They are a type because the law is the order by which the people are to live, and the logos, the word, capital word of God, is the order by which the entire universe runs and comes into being. So there's a correlation there between the word, written word, ten commands on the, st on the stone tablets, and the eternal logos word. There is, of course, the hookup between the priestly staff, the symbol of the priesthood, which is what Aaron was. Aaron was from the, you know, the, the tribe that offered sacrifice and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then there is uh, you know, Christ as priest, as high priest, eternal high priest. And then there is, of course, the manna uh, from the uh, desert. It is the manna fed to them in the desert. So you've got these three aspects of Christ inside the ark. They don't realize that yet, but that's what they are. The, the, they're all archetypes pointing towards uh, the second person of the Holy Trinity. So if you were to say who was in the ark, the obvious answer would be Jesus Christ was in the ark in, his, uh, in, type, in type. So something else also happened once they became, once they'd gone to Mount Sinai and the whole scene had happened with the golden calf and all that stuff and everything and they and built the ark and put it in the tent. There is a uh, a way that uh, the Lord God now comes to His people and manifests Himself to His people, and it's called the glory cloud, and it's in the desert as they're wandering around for these forty years, and it descends on the tabernacle. And when it descended on the tabernacle, they pitched, you know, they pitched camp. I mean, they're nomads wandering through the desert for 40 years. Sometimes they pitch camp and they hang out there and, you know, do whatever. And, our, you know, God is feeding them with the manna from the desert and the quail descend on the camp and they grab the quail and kill them and eat them. And, you know, they sort of pitch, pitch camp for a little bit. But then when it's time to unpitch camp and get up and keep moving again, well, then uh, the cloud, the glory cloud, would ascend and leave the, uh, the tent, uh, the tabernacle. Tent and tabernacle are the same thing in, the, in this sense. Uh, and that was the signal to, okay, get up and let's go, and, and God would lead them to the next place. So there's this sort of back and forth thing going on uh, that when the, when the tabernacle, the tent is pitched and camp is set up, and the Ark of the Covenant is inside the tabernacle, inside the tent, the glory cloud would come and rest over it. And that was the sign of God being with his people. He said that, you know, this, this is where I will dwell in your midst. Um, the, ark, a matter, the Ark, as a matter of fact, is so important that whenever there are military battles, generally speaking, uh, the, uh, uh, when that's going on, the ark, when the Ark is present, there's victory. And when the ark is not present or it's missing, as it was captured by the Philistines at one point in the Holy Land, uh, they lose. Those aren't, that's not a hard and fast rule, but it's way, way easily the general rule. Uh, this goes on, the glory cloud moving around with them, hovering over the, the, the tent, the tabernacle, for 40 years in the desert. When it raises, it's kind of like the signal, get up and let's go to the next place. And they're led to wherever it is they need to go. They pitch camp again and... Boom, everything, and it just keeps repeating that. It goes on to 40 years, and they get right to the edge, so to speak, of the Holy Land. And when they get to the Holy Land, uh, Moses, of course, as we've said yesterday, uh, 
dies. He does not cross over the frontier into the Holy Land. He dies. They bury him on Mount Nebo, and kind of the next phase begins. But Moses' absence has nothing to do uh, with the ark continuing. The ark remains a very central point of, uh, of the life of, well, they weren't Jews at that point, but the life of the, of the, uh, of the chosen people. It's, it's the center point. And when, again, 400 years later, the temple's built, it goes into the temple as the center point. So now they reach the Holy Land. Let's go through a little bit of a timeline here, if we can, just to you know, blow through centuries in a, in a couple of minutes. The uh, traveling around in the, it, roughly the uh, exodus from Egypt, uh, historians seem to put it somewhere between 1400, 1450 B.C., so uh, there's the 40 years of wandering around out in the desert. Then they reach the frontier. They cross over into the frontier, and they're there for roughly 400 years. And they're moving around. The ark is moving around, and they're moving around. Uh, with, and the ark itself, the, the, the tent, the tabernacle, has temporary homes. It's sort of set up uh, in various places all around. And for example, we know because they're mentioned specifically, uh, Gilgal, Shiloh, Bethel, these are all different places that, again, sort of in the sense of the, uh, what was going on in the desert, sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the nomadic existence getting to the Holy Land. Once they get to the Holy Land, then there's the sort of clearing out of the nations that needs to happen. Remember, the land is Canaan, uh, and the idea of that being, I mean, no, there, none of the chosen people have been there since Abraham was there 400 years earlier. Uh, Abraham and Sarah, and they you know, encountered uh, Melchizedek. Uh, all of that had happened in around 1800 B.C., uh, so they haven't been back here for 400 years, and it, uh, you know a whole new civilization has grown up there, and it's the land of Canaan. So they are going into the land of Canaan uh, and fighting these folks and fighting these folks and everything else. Uh, and of course, then we have a, uh, a battle with the Philistines. Now, <laughs> uh, the Philistines actually captured the Ark uh, briefly, uh, and I have to put in here a little LOL at the, at the end of this, uh, because it makes the, uh, the scriptures tell us that there was a uh, God afflicted them. You know, they're like, ha ha, we've got it. The Jews march around with this, with this uh, ark. It's everywhere. It leads them everywhere they need to go. You know, they think God is like directly connected to that ark. And we have it. Ha ha ha. And they take it off. Uh, you know, they take it back to camp. It's a big prize, you know. Uh, except <laughs> scriptures tell us God afflicted them with tumors. Now, the actual... Transla <laughs> the actual translation of tumors, the way it's used there, actually <laughs> means, I'm sorry, it's just a, it's just a funny thought, <laughs> uh, that God afflicted them with hemorrhoids. <laughs> and, uh, and apparently the uh, hemorrhoidal condition grew much worse. As long as they held on to the ark, they had uh, that. And uh, so you could imagine why they very quickly decided, let's give them the ark back. And so they quickly run back to the Jews and say, yeah, it's been nice. We kept it. It's very nice. Here, here you go. It's yours. And, and they, gave it, <laughs> they gave it back to them. It's just a little funny thing. Anyway, uh, about the, so that's going on for those roughly 400 years once they've reached the Holy Land. The th uh, around 1000 BC uh, is what we could start to refer to as the King David era. And of course, David, you know, defeats Goliath with the, his sling and the rock in his head and all that and everything. David's king, anointed king. Uh, at some point, David is, is sort of possessed of the idea of the ark and the tabernacle, the big tent, need to move to this uh, a permanent dwelling in the city of David. Uh, and the city of David uh, itself is not, it's right sort of on the downward slope of Jerusalem. We were there for the uh, Holy Land documentary we did on the Eucharist. And it is not like, it, Jerusalem is not the city of David. The city of David was a smaller little community that is outside the walls of what Jerusalem is today. But the area certainly uh, is the city of David. Uh, and he's, he becomes just possessed of the idea this the, the ark must be here, must be in the city of David. So they decide to uh, move it and you know, start a procession and move it from where it was to the city of David. And this is where this, that story, that account comes up of uh, a man named Uzzah. And on the way as they're carrying it, remember from yesterday, they're supposed to carry it on those poles that are through the rings. They're never supposed to touch it. They can't carry it any other way. That was what part of God's command. You put the poles in, the poles remain in the little rings, and you carry it. 
by that, by no other means. Well, the, the uh, ark was put onto a cart that was being drawn by ox or oxen. And as it was rounding a corner or whatever, it started to tip because the oxen kind of, I don't know, lost their footing or whatever, you know, the, the weight of it shifted. Uh, and this poor unfortunate fellow with good intentions, Uzzah, put his hand out because it was starting to tip off the cart. He put his hand out and he touched it and God struck him dead for touching it. You were, this ark was so pure that nobody could even touch it. That's what the purpose of the, uh, uh, the, purpose of the uh, uh, poles was, to carry it that way. You could not touch the ark. So we have all of this encapsulated for us, and it's all accounted for in 2 Samuel. And here it is, we'll read that scripture. As they reached the threshing floor of Nodon, Uzzah stretched out his hand to the ark of God and steadied it, for the oxen were tipping it. Then the Lord became angry with Uzzah. God struck him on that spot, and he died there in God's presence. David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. Therefore, that place has been called Perez Uzahaven to this day. David became frightened of the Lord that day, and he said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? Stop for a second right there. Does that sound familiar? How can the ark of the Lord come to me? Why is it the mother of my Lord should come to me? Fast forward, uh, you know, 500 years, sorry, 1,000 years. So David was unwilling to take the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David. David deposited it instead at the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months. Three months, huh? Three months, remained somewhere for three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. When it was reported to King David that the Lord had blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that he possessed because of the ark of God, David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with joy. And that is how we get from the ark at Mount Sinai uh, at roughly 1400, 1450 BC into the city of David. The next part of it is that we'll cover uh, tomorrow and then uh, uh, we'll begin to uh, show the connection between our Blessed Mother and the Ark of the Covenant, although some of those are uh, already kind of beginning to ooze out, so to speak. Those types are beginning to ooze out from the Old Testament scripture and accounts anyway. Uh, but uh, so it moves from Mount Sinai where they fashion it uh, through the desert for 40 years into the promised land, follows them around in all of their victories and battles as they're clearing out the land of Canaan, claiming it for themselves. David takes it to the city of David, which is just, you know, 100 yards, 200 yards away from what are today the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, Solomon, his son, uh, brings the, uh, builds the temple, moves the ark into uh, the temple, into the center of the temple, into the area called the Holy of Holies. So that becomes a marble stone uh, tabernacle uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the actual Ark of the Covenant. Um, that's it on the Ark of the Covenant getting there. We will pick up again tomorrow, uh, specifically with uh, all the various typologies of how the Ark represents our Blessed Mother, although you've seen a few of them already. Okay, so now is when we take some uh, questions. Uh, take our first one here. It seems like many people mistake humility for being a pushover. How can we humble, how can we be humble, but also remain firm in the truth? Humility, uh, you know, Bishop Sheen makes a distinction. Bishop Fulton Sheen, Venerable Fulton Sheen, makes the distinction be uh, between tolerance. You're always tolerant of people but you're never tolerant of principles. Principles are the mega types that people run their lives by. And if, they, if you compromise on uh, or you are tolerant of a bad principle, many bad things happen. Tolerance of an individual is one thing. So when we just take that template and move it over to the question of humility, a person can be humble about himself or herself on a personal level. They understand their weaknesses, they understand their, you know, how much they let God down and all those things of the spiritual life and how 
desperately in need uh, they are of God. That's being a humble person. But that doesn't mean that when you're standing in the presence of God and you're being correctly very humble, you know, barely raising your eyes to heaven as the one uh, example that our Lord gave in scripture of the, the publican and the Pharisee, just you know, didn't even raise his eyes to heaven. Well, that's true humility. Uh, but that doesn't mean, because look, lots of personalities, people's personalities, lots of people are very comfortable being kind of shy and tucked away and kind of out of the scene and just kind of off in the shadows and quietly, you know, they, they don't like confrontation and all that stuff. Not that lots of people like confrontation. Uh, so humility applies to the person. It does not apply to the approach to defend the truth. That must be bold. There is no compromise with truth. There is no compromise or being tolerant with a bad principle when it is not you per se as your individual, like me sitting here as you know, Mike or Michael doing my own little thing with God. That's humility. Uh, but striking out at something that is wrong, sinful, evil, wicked, leads people astray, a bad principle, you don't get to be tolerant of those or kind of be like the doormat who's getting walked over and pushed over and somehow excuse yourself for not uh, being bold when boldness is called for uh, and, say, and, and, be like, and then hide behind humility. Humility is, is the relationship between me, the man, the individual person, and God. It is not the relationship I'm supposed to have in regard to the truth. In the truth, I have to switch. Lots of people will use the term, uh, you know, well, you have to be prudent. Prudent is another one of those terms. It's like humility. Well, you know, be prudent. Well, prudent doesn't mean sit there and shut up and say nothing and be walked over by a doormat. Prudent means responding to the situation as how the situation needs responding. If the house is on fire you, and you know, people are dying inside the house, you don't say, maybe I should call the fire department, but I don't know if that would be prudent or not. Of course it would be prudent. You're running around the house screaming your head off, get out, get out, jump out of the windows. Uh, so, yeah, there, a lot of people who have, I don't want to say weak personalities, they're just more comfortable, reserved, don't like stepping forward. And the uh, an overemphasis on humility so that it spills over away from them and out into how they deal with evil in the world becomes a very convenient excuse. A person should always be humble. A person's attitude to the truth should always be bold. That's the difference. Next question. It seems like the greatest generation... I mean, folks who went and fought World War II, for those of you who don't know what that is, it seems like the greatest generation really dropped the ball when it came to protecting Holy Mother Church. How do we, young people, reverse the trend? You know, when you go back and you look at the history of what happened immediately after World War II, uh, you know, World War II was a absolute watershed moment, not just in military history and all that sort of thing, but you think of everything that was ushered in because of World War II. Uh, enormous, enormous numbers of women came into the workforce, for example. Uh, the, uh, uh, everybody had had enough of war. I mean, remember, just 20 years earlier, you'd had World War I, which had claimed 11 million lives, and it was uh, so bad, they called it, it was nicknamed the War to End All Wars. And as our Blessed Mother said at Fatima, well, people continue to sin, and you have something even worse. Well, a war with five times the amount of killing uh, ensued in World War II. So in the first half of the 20th century, 65 to 70 million people were killed. Nations realigned, maps redrawn, everything. All these American uh, servicemen, whatever they were in, the Army, Navy, whatever, all come back. There's a, there's a recession because you know, the economy is trying to adjust to all this major move off a of wartime footing back onto a peacetime footing, so people can't get jobs because factories are switching over. The whole social dynamic of what was going on right in the immediate aftermath of World War II uh, really created a mindset uh, that we want a better world, and there was a lot of emphasis on sort of the material uh, existence. Likewise, when you throw in the fact that American Catholic uh, soldiers and seamen and so forth uh, had been pretty much scorned uh, before that. Uh, Catholics in general had been scorned. There was the Know Nothing Party in the Northeast and you know, Irish need not apply and all that stuff. Um, 
but you know they wind up in these foxholes with you know Protestants and who else other Americans and uh, and the rest of them start to say hey, these Catholic folks they're not so bad and uh, if there was one thing that really kind of I think sealed the fate for the church in America it was the great desire to be sitting at the Protestant table of acceptance you know we were grossly outnumbered percentage wise uh, and you know, always this minority, and always feeling like you have to go sit at the back of the bus, and all that sort of stuff. To borrow, you know, the reality of African Americans during the civil, prior to the civil rights movement, you know, you're always scorned, want nothing to do with you, the whole bit. And everybody wants to be liked. Everybody wants to be liked. Part of our nature. Uh, so there was this great willingness because of the horror of the war and the effect of it, and the economics and everything else. And, hey, all of a sudden, we have an ability here to actually be kind of accepted. We get a place at the table. So those two things, I think, really combined to uh, make uh, many Catholics of the day, the greatest generation, uh, uh, be willing to compromise left and right. They tolerated things that were not good. Uh, you know, when Pope Paul VI issued his encyclical Humanae Vitae in 1968, there was an immediate revolt against it on the part of the laity as well and still is, 50 years later, still is. And uh, why is that? Uh, because people were, American Catholics were willing to sacrifice the faith so that they could have the better life for themselves and their children, the chasing of the American dream, which you know objectively is not a bad thing, but if you overdo it, it becomes a bad thing. And their willingness to kind of shut up and suck it up so they didn't want to sort of upset this newfound acceptance that they'd had. So if those are the major things, a willingness to want to hold on to the things of the world and be accepted by people, if that's what sort of started the church on its big, huge downward uh, trajectory here in the United States, well then for the younger generations, the exact opposite is true. You have to not be concerned with worldly Things you got. I mean, you know, you got to have a you know whatever house, and if you're gonna get married, you have to have a job and kids and insurance and things like that. But they can't become this like this race of like keeping up with the Joneses. I got to have the better this and the better that and this and that and everything, and just investing your entire being in material wealth, and then of course being accepted. You will lose some aspect or at least an access to that material wealth if you are being intolerant uh, of the pervading principles of the day. Uh, you know, that everybody's equal and, you know, uh, you know, you know, don't bother me. I won't bother you. You live your life. I'll live my life. There's no really objective truth. I mean, I prefer this, but you can have that. If you challenge that, you're going to lose something of your material wealth. So decouple yourself now from the desire uh, of, of, you know, finishing, you know, dying with the most toys. It doesn't matter if you die with the most toys. You don't get to take them with you. Uh, it isn't, it's that combination, my humble opinion, that's the combination. Those two things sort of sacrificed, uh, they, they laid the church on the altar of sacrifice. Uh, and the world and the devil went crazy and, you know, uh, have been trying to kill on that altar, you know, ever since. You know, that's 70, 80 years. Um, it's a, uh, uh, it's very frightening. It's very frightening, you know, and I think we here at Church Militant and other good Catholics all around the country always have in our mind, how do you get this back? You know, is it able to be gotten back? If it is, what would it look like? Those are all very good questions. All you know is you've got to just keep saying the truth. You have to keep saying the truth. You keep yourself humble before God. You keep yourself as a paragon of the truth uh, to man in those areas. You simply have to. That's all you can do. Uh, you do that. Whatever happens, happens. If it's really, really tough in life, well, you know, this life comes to an end, thank God. Uh, if, it's, uh, if you don't have it as bad as some other people, because, you know, whatever, pe people respond to you better, I don't know, how, all the different things in human dynamics. However it plays out, it plays out. But you have to go before the throne of God uh, with, you know, the right enemies. You've just got to. Mother Angelica said that. You know, Bishop Sheen said that. Uh, in one form or another, all the great saints have said this. You know, you have to accrue the right enemies. My dad used to say that to me. You don't want to go to, you don't want to, go to the judgment seat without having a list of the right enemies, uh, which is, you know, a nice, fun dad way of saying, make sure you stand up for the truth. And when you do, people are going to hate you for it. Oh, well, they hate you for it. You know, big deal. 
Uh, that'll wrap us up for today. We've got some more questions. We'll get to them uh, tomorrow. Also, reminder, 445, we're in the chapel praying evening prayer, vespers, right there in that little middle chair. I sit there all by myself. <laughs> but the rest of the staff is praying uh, electronically, remotely, and also out here in the in our media pit for those who are there. We wrap up every day with the uh, St. Michael prayer. We put it up in Latin, we pray it in English, and then we pray it in Latin, and uh, we'll begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Sancta Michael Archangele, defende nos in prelio contra nicritiam et insidias diaboli esto presidium. Imperati li Deus, supliceste precamor, tuque princeps miletiae celestis, santa namoliosque spiritus malignos, quiad perditionum animarem pervergantur de mundo, divina virtute in infernum de trude. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Wraps us up for today. We'll see you here on Merry Moments Live tomorrow, 1 p.m. God love you.